Good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. It's 7.30 p.m. here in Warsaw, Poland. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining me this, this evening or afternoon or morning uh, to have this discussion about, well, we're going to be talking about the philosophy of nominalism. I've mentioned this many times before, and it's time that we dive deeply into this. It'll help us understand the threat of modernism that we're dealing with today. And of course, the whole transanity that we're dealing with and uh, woke. Yeah, so let's see. We've got John. Welcome. John Xland. Good to see you. Thank you, John. Horse, of course. Horse, we need to chat sometime, right? That 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 that, that invitation stands would be wonderful. Uh, Protestant Believer, welcome. And Lilo Mine, welcome. Good to see you. So, yeah, guys, apparently I'm doing YouTube all wrong. I've got to start off with Joel Thomas, Sergeant Grinch. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got to uh, start off YouTube with some kind of intro. So it's like ladles and jelly spoons. We, I stand upon this speech to make a platform. The, the train I arrived in has not yet come, so I, I took a bus and I walked. And I come before you to stand behind you. And, and I got inspiration from Joe Biden. So I hope that was a great YouTube intro. I'll, if you guys liked it, I'll standardize it. And of course, I have to end my YouTube talks with a, with a common sort of phrase as well. Um, you know, like App State Prophet has a cool one. It's like, stay away from Islam. I'm going to try and provide something that's more practical, better advice. I'm going to start with something like, um, remember to flush, sorry, remember to floss after meals, or remember to check your oil and do an oil change if you uh, need to change the oil. And <clears throat> Roseanne, you can just scroll back. It's only been like 30 seconds. So yeah, guys, so so let me know if you need me to, to, to do like proper YouTube intros and outros, you know, and I can remind you guys to like floss or remember to brush your teeth after meals or uh you know check your oil and remember also to check tire pressure before driving long distances if that would help if that would add the proper sort of youtubeness to the youtube side uh pigs can fly did you get to see the debate between matt de la hunt and andrew wilson um is that way is that where matt de la hunt he lost his cool and um rage quit off the uh rage quit off the off the talk because Matt Delante is dating a man. <laughs> is that the one? Okay. Yeah, guys. Yes, that's the one. Yeah, I saw that one. Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> right, guys. So, anyway, good to see you. Um, today is Saturday. I, yeah, thought um, there's, there's a lot of material that I need to get through. Of course, there's loads of material that I am trying to do a synthesis of all of these crazy philosophies that happened from the time of Luther, but even prior, but really consolidated under the time of Luther, then into the Reformation, because next I will be swinging into the Reformation, and we'll be going through these Reformation philosophers that are so famous and such great men that are just absolute idiots, and we'll be talking at length about those, and then we will be um, trying to tie this into events that are happening today, and of course the impact in Christianity, and why the the philosophies that that were established with Christian thinking, why those ideas, that worldview is superior. Yes, pigs can fly. I know about John Money. I've known about John Money for like 10 years at least. Uh, I know the story quite well. Um, he was discussed a long time ago. And uh, yeah, people need to know about him. Protestant believer, never drink yellow snow. Yeah, I'll add that to the list of things so I can provide useful advice to to the audience at the end of each talk. So yeah, guys, if you like my, um, my, my, as you guys know, this channel is totally serious. There is never any sarcasm on this channel. We don't do sarcasm. We stick to the facts only. And um, we never tell dad jokes or any, anything like that. We are all business on this channel. So if you guys like that, do hit the like, subscribe and uh, share. And uh, Roseanne says, I was just told last night that no one really knows which church is the true church. That, that is not true. <laughs> I don't think that's true. Never spit into the wind. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very good, Sergeant Grinch. How about a Johnny Carson Tonight Show theme music in the background? <laughs> Pigs can fly. I don't know the tales of Symphonia. I don't know that. Um, I used to like the line from the God. There's the God Pigeon in um, Animaniacs uh, where the God Pigeon was like, was not, not the God Pigeon, was uh, one of the other characters, like the, the fox, I think it was like, hello, my victim people. <laughs> So, <clears throat> never trust Martin Lucifer. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this talk is going to be 66 slides. I'll probably only do a third of it today. Martin Luther is going to take a beating in this one. And I'm working, I've worked there. I spent a few hours on my actual Martin Luther talk. 
Um, obviously, there, there's many, many things that I could talk about Martin Luther that are the, the common thing. I'm going to skip all the common stuff. We're going to dig into the things where, that Martin Luther said that are egregiously blasphemous, egregiously vile, just absolutely unchristian and wrong. We're going to tackle this man from a different angle. Now, of course, apologists will dismiss one thing he said or another thing he said and have an excuse for it or whatever the case might be. But as they start stacking up, as the pile gets bigger, you'll realize this man didn't just make an honest mistake. It wasn't just a one-off <clears throat> one time that he misspoke. You'll realize this guy was off the rails. Merle, Mealy Dave, welcome. So, yeah, don't put lipstick on a sow. <laughs> Yeah, non-denominational. So, you know, I just wrote an article on um, my coffee page on non-denominationalism um, just to get people thinking about this idea, but it's a non-committal position. It's, it's a completely non-committal position. It, it, it basically just, yeah, it's, it's just a nowhere place that you go. You know, it's the spot where you give up thinking. I could do a Star Wars text scroll screen overlay as an intro with all the good advice collected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, so, you know, wear sunscreen. Yeah, I can try things like that. Hopefully that'll, apparently that's how you do YouTube properly. Okay, so let's see. 66, I smell Luciferian slides, yeah. Okay, we should jump into this, so welcome everyone. Okay, so we're going to be talking about woke, trans sanity, and the threat of nominalism. This philosophy is a threat. It is a substantial part, I suppose I can tell, of keep your camel tied up, yes, of what we're dealing with. Now, you've heard the claim before that, or the phrase before that, ideas have consequences. Well, philosophy has consequences, and we're going to have, have to have a look at the consequences of this philosophy. All right. <clears throat> what will help is if you have a look at this talk. This was two parts that I did on scientific paganism, right? When 6th century science, philosophical squabbles became science. Right. This is something that's worth watching, which will give you additional background into what we're discussing here. All right. So just to kick off, just to give us some context, because I'm kind of carrying over from the one talk into the other. What is scientific paganism? Right. So this is to do with materialism. Now, materialism is an ancient philosophical view. It comes from ancient Greece. You can go to ancient Rome and so on. It is the belief that reality is composed only of physical matter, nothing else. Effectively, all that we can observe and all that there is, is simply matter extending into space. So it excludes the existence of immaterial minds, souls, moral values, and God, right? It excludes the metaphysical. So materialism effectively disappeared during the rise of Christianity, but resurfaced during the Enlightenment. And of course, we can thank a certain Martin Luther for reintroducing some of these incredibly crazy ideas into society once more. Along with that, we also have to bring in the arch-Catholic um, William of Ockham. But William of Ockham, we're going to be, we, I will dedicate a section to him in this talk. We're going to be talking about William of Ockham because we really need to understand his role in this. <clears throat> so, atheist philosophers promoted materialism to justify disbelief in God and to reject Christian morality. So they've rejected the Ten Commandments and so on. So they argue that only matter exists, meaning there is no free will and no moral responsibility. Yes, exactly. They people who don't want to be held accountable, Protestant uh, believer, correct. So in the 19th century, materialism influences pseudoscientific theories like phrenology. I discussed phrenology on Wednesday. If you want to go back to my talk on Wednesday or Thursday um, that I just did, thank you for subscribing. Will Ant Antunovich. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's something obscuring my your name, so I can't quite see the end of it. But great to have you. Right. So I did a talk on um, on materialism and the evidence against materialism. Right. And I discussed phrenology. Now, don't forget, also the 19th century was an explosion of various heresies of schisms. In the 19th century, don't forget, you've got things like the Advent movement. So you get the Seventh Day Adventists, you get the Jehovah's Witnesses, you get the Mormons. That whole period, suddenly hundreds, hundreds of new heresies sprang up, right? So these things all are tied to that period, as well as the, the historical critique, the attack on Christianity and the Bible by claiming it's not historical, it's all fake, etc. Right? Oh, by the way, before I go, before I go further, I should show you that this particular talk, I have it 
currently available. Uh, give me one sec. It is currently available on my coffee page. It is, and I will pin this into the. I'm actually just pin this. I meant to do that. So let me make a pinned comment here and then uh, I'll continue. So. Right. So I just dropped that in the chat. So this, I've made this particular talk available. Um, I would double the price, but for now, just since we're online, I'll make it $5 for the, for the duration of the stream and I'll increase the price later. So if you guys want to catch this, uh, you can get it now at half the price. All right. So I've got all of these notes available for you guys to, to download. All right, let's continue. Now, today, some atheists claims, some atheists claim that science proves materialism, right? This is false. I've dealt with that at length already, right? This is not a true claim by any means. It's a pagan claim. It's basically pagan Greek philosophy. And it's a very false philosophy because it's simply an error, right? Yes, during the Enlightenment, occultism was rife. So this wasn't the Age of Enlightenment. This was the Age of Occultism, right? Just like the Nazis, at first it was a conspiracy theory that the Nazis were occultists. And then, of course, it's now become accepted that these guys were very much into the occult. The Enlightenment is no different. The Enlightenment was the Age of the Freemasons and the Age of the Occultists. So yes, it wasn't the Age of Reason. GOK, materialism is like intellectually hand handicapping yourself. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's incoherent. It's, I've discussed it at length in my, my couple of last few talks. So materialism has a history of undermining traditional morality and promoting relativism, right? So you have no objective reality. There's no objective morality, right? It is a philosophical assumption. It is not a scientific finding. It is an assumption. It is a worldview that is based on error. Now, moral absolutes, to provide additional context, we get our original moral absolutes from the law of Moses, right? So Western philosophy uses the concept of universals and moral absolutes. These are the foundations of rational thought. You must have universals, objective universals. You must have certain essences that don't change to have a, a basis to work from, something that's a standard that does not change, that you can use as a reference point. So moral absolutes refers to the idea that they are objective and universally valid moral principles that apply to all individuals and situations. Like, for instance, Muslims will tell you, well, it was okay for Muhammad to be stooping a child because then it was okay, right? But now it's not okay because the science has changed. Whereas in the Christian worldview, that is wrong. It has always been wrong. It will always be wrong. It is wrong now. It was wrong then. It will never be right. That is a, a moral view that will never change, right? So that is the difference. They have these values that are subjective or relativistic or influenced by time and place. So which means there is no fixed moral point. They can always sweet talk their way into or out of a position as they see fit, right? So <clears throat> let's take a couple of moral absolute examples. So for instance, the moral absolute of do not murder. This universally valid principle holds that taking another person's life without just cause is morally wrong. It applies to all individuals and situations, regardless of cultural or societal differences. Within ancient times of moral or modern society, this principle is always valid. We don't take a life. We are not the givers of life, therefore we don't have the right to take a life. If you need to protect your life, sure. And if this person will harm the people behind you, fine. You are forced into that position. You've been pushed there, right? When you aren't looking to do so, and then in which case you have something that you need to protect and therefore you will do so, but this person is in the process of trying to harm you and there will be greater harm if you don't shut them down. Right? The moral absolute of do not steal. This principle says that taking another person's property without the permission is morally wrong. It applies universally to all individuals and situations, right? This is something, of course, we have in the Ten Commandments. So this is part of our part of our moral substrate. The moral value of tell the truth. This is an absolute. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Logos. The Logos is the truth, the word that is true, right? The spoken word that must be the truth. So this principle holds that telling the truth and being honest is universally valid in all situations. It applies to individuals of all cultures and backgrounds, emphasizing the importance of truthfulness and integrity. It's an ideal that we strive for. Now, we may not reach the ideal, but it's something that we know is an objective reality that we strive for. Right. So, wow, thank you very much, Lil. Much appreciated. Thank you for the support. All right. Thanks for purchasing the uh, presentation. So this applies to all individuals, right? And we also know that if they don't have this as an objective truth, that means that they immediately descend into the lie because we must have a distinction between truth and lie. And if we know what the truth is, then they descend into the lie by default. So these all tell us how moral absolutes are objective and universally valid principles, right? They apply to all individuals and situations. They guide moral judgment and actions regardless of cultural and individual differences. We must understand, though, that certain cultures and certain religions, certain groups, don't hold these values. Some religions are evil. Let's just be honest about that. So, when ideology meets reality. So, the first few slides here, I'm going to be... Um, the first seven slides, I think. So, I should have mentioned in the beginning, the first seven slides give us an overview, encapsulate the general ideas of this talk. So within the first, up to slide seven, we should be able to have a reasonable idea. If someone's in a crunch for time, the first seven slides are sufficient to get a good idea of what I'm talking about. After slide seven, then I go into much more detail and branch into the arguments. All right, so what are the logical, let's, let's pose a question. What are the logical and legal implications if a Supreme Court judge refuses to acknowledge that a woman is a female human that can bear children? A Supreme Court judge refuses to state that a woman is a female human that can bear children. What if this judge refuses to define what a woman is? How does this affect application and interpretation of law if the legal system does not know and cannot define what a woman is? How do we define the law? How do we apply the law? For instance, in this example, if the legal system has no idea what a woman is, what if it doesn't know what theft is? What if it refuses to define theft in a concrete, objective manner with a single standard, right? Short answer. How can we have equal treatment under the law or apply the law fairly if we cannot define who the law applies to? Who does the law apply to? All you have then is uncertainty, doubt, confusion. Longer answer. This would be extremely troubling. This would be dangerous. Law relies on clear definitions. How can you have scientific laws? How can you have moral laws? How can you have civic laws if you don't have clear definitions, if you don't have a single standard, right? How can you have mathematics if one plus one, you cannot admit that it's equal to two if it's flexible, right? So if you do not have clear definitions and terms in order to apply the law properly, you cannot apply the law anymore. If the highest court in the land refuses to define something as basic as what constitutes a woman, it threatens the foundation of the legal system. How can laws related to women's rights, healthcare, privacy, and more be fairly adjudicated if womanhood itself is undefinable? How can you? If you don't know what a woman is, how can you apply law to a woman, right? Think of what's happening in sports today, right? We'll discuss more about that. <clears throat> this only invites chaos and absurdity, right? The rule of law has to be sacred. It must be upheld. Judges have a solemn duty to apply the law as written and not redefine society on a whim. So, refusing to define a womanhood is a postmodernist game. It threatens to undermine reason, objectivity, and shared truths. So these are the truths that bind society together. <coughs> so resign, yes, nothing is true anymore. Exactly. If we don't have definitions, then nothing is true. Everything is true. That means you have chaos. Right? Yeah, ask these people if it's okay to eat their parents. Exactly. Yeah, how can she preside as a judge? I know, Razan. Exactly. That, that's why I was thinking this example shocked the hell out of me. You know, I mean, what happened at Harvard as well, but I thought this was an example, the law. I mean, it's that is 
you have a Supreme Court judge. How can she rule on women's cases if she doesn't know what a woman is, right? What if I told her, uh, here's a woman and this woman, um, you know, needs to get alimony because, because I don't know. And, and then she rules in favor of, because that can be a woman, right? I mean, I buy a bra, I stick two tennis balls in there and I'm a woman now and and um, a man beat me up and give me money, uh, whatever. You understand the, the, the issues here? Okay, so the Supreme Court must reject nonsense and fulfill their duty to base decisions on facts, logic, and the law, right? Blue Light Moon says, reading about nominalism gave me a headache. Yes, I had to do a lot of reading. I've got 66 slides. Yeah, I did a lot of reading and a lot of writing. And uh, as you guys know, I do offer you guys free typos, free grammar errors in every presentation. So uh, I hope you guys appreciate those. I especially put those in that little Easter egg. So, so try and look for them, right? They, they're not, they, I, I planned to put those in there. So defining womanhood is not an imposition of values, right? It is not imposing values and excluding others. It is an acknowledgement of biological and physical reality. She is denying and not acknowledging reality. Gender's like a box of chocolates. Exactly. Dr. Jonathan Gemmel, welcome. Hi. For anyone who's missed the first few minutes, so you guys can always go back to the beginning and just go run it at 1.75 speed and you'll catch up shortly. Okay, nominalism. The notion that words and definitions have no objective meaning or grounding is nominalism. So this whole word games, that, that words have no actual meaning. They're just arbitrary labels and we can just change the label at random, right? This is nominalism. Nominalism, I'll discuss the definition later, but it's of the name. Nominal, look up the etymology of the word nominalism. We'll discuss that later. It leads directly to the kinds of absurdities that we are discussing. If there are no objective truths or meanings, if everything is just a social construct. Oh, I keep, what you know, I hate when it does this. I mean, there we go. Let me just disable and I keep forgetting. Oh, I hate when my, I have, I don't know what is wrong with my camera. Let me just adjust it. There we go. Problem solved. All right. If there are no objective, <laughs> oh, the zoom. Yeah. So hold on. Let me zoom here. That's me. And then that's me. That's me. Actually, let me, yeah, my camera. Uh, let me just go zoom all the way out. Actually, let me go back here since, since we're talking about that. Yeah, you can see here. So this is zoomed all the way out zoomed all the way in yeah and uh yeah so yeah because of your guys generosity i've been able to to buy some some reasonably good uh equipment not wrong way yeah so fun toys and thank you <laughs> thanks to you guys okay so back to the uh <clears throat> back to the discussion at hand so um if there are no objective truths, no objective, oopsie, hold on, let me, if there's no objective truths or meanings, right, if everything is just a social construct, then who is to say a man cannot be a woman simply by declaring it so? Why can't we redefine any word to mean anything we want? Artsy fartsy nerdy wordy was Babylon cursed with nominalism at the end. It may well have been, I, I suspect. Look, these, when you're dealing with, okay, You've got these definitions. We've got these philosophies that are defined. We've got words that are defined. We've got terms and concepts. But of course, if you are not someone who is bound by, by strictness, then you are simply going to take a little bit of it, mixed with something else, make up your own error. And that's what we have. That's why you have all of these con conver diverging errors. They all converge on certain errors, but they also diverge because it's, it's all subjective. It's all relative. So hence, you don't get clear definitions. You don't, you don't get them. For instance, if you look at the Protestant movement, why doesn't it all converge on the same truth? They all, literally, I mean, prove me wrong, but Protestants all claim to have found the truth. The Holy Spirit's talking to them. They have the truth. Why didn't they get to one plus one is equal to two? Every single one of them. Because they've all come up with their own personal interpretation. It's entirely subjective. It's all their feelings. It's all their personal whims. Understand? That's why they are all over the map, contradictory, as well as incompatible. Because it's when you have error, you just make it up as you go. If there's only one truth, then you're going to come to a single truth. Right. 
So, Dr. Obvious, greetings all. The Supreme Court Justice, who didn't know what a woman is, is was being coy. Black's Law Dictionary does not have a definition for woman, but does for women. Yeah, maybe she's... But look, it's all word games, right? It's all word games. Sophistry's best friend, nominalism. Yes. Right, so if there are no objective truths, right, then I can, I can claim I'm a woman. I can claim I'm a banana, right? So, and we can redefine anything that we want. And redefinition, atheists do it, you know it, and Muslims do it all the time. They redefine terms. Sadly, I've already discussed this, and I will when I get back to Luther. Redefinition of terms is something that Protestants, the early Protestants did as well. Right? They had a special practice specifically to do just that redefine terms the way that they wanted them right so this is the philosophical junk food that the radical left has been feeding on for decades nominalism strips language of meaning it divorces words from objective reality when that happens the law follows philosophy ideas have consequences and once the idea is implanted the law is affected and the law becomes unmoored from its basis because the law is supposed to be factual, based in objective reality and moral. But once you've introduced this whole nominalistic idea, the law is no longer based in fact, it is no longer objective, and it is no longer moral. Understand? These ideas have consequences. So we recognize that words have objective meaning, right? Which flows from how nature, biology, and society have traditionally understood these words, right? Reality, as we believe it, in our realist view, which has been the view of the church from the beginning, right? And was defined by the scholastics from the 10th century onwards, 11th century onwards into the 15th century and so on, 16th century. Reality exists independent of our descriptions of it. It's not something that's purely subjective that we perceive within our skin and create as an illusion, right? It is something that exists objectively outside of us. So a woman is an adult human female that can have children. Sex is defined, there's only two things. Either you produce sperm or you produce eggs, right? The gametes. It's simple. It's really simple. You can either, you either produce sperm or you produce eggs. That, that's it. Those are the only, that's the binary. It's that simple, right? And women are the ones producing the eggs. That's it. They can have children, right? And this has been so since the dawn of time. Not just because some court redefined women for political purposes, and of course, nominalism denies this common sense view and invites the incoherence and absurdity we now see on display today, this woke madness, right? So nominalism is the deeper rot, the underlying rot, the idea, the confusion, the, the corrosive, destructive ideology underneath this. So a certain Supreme Court judge needs a crash course in realism and objectivism, but she chose radical philosophy and gender theory. So the problem is not just superficial, the problem is the error in the underlying philosophy. So, if a tree falls in a forest, does it still make a sound if no one is there to hear it? Now, that's interesting. Um, to try and answer that question, I actually, actually, I, I, there was a discussion on that one time, and it said that no. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is there to hear it, it makes no sound. It makes vibrations. Sound is something that's created in the ear. When those vibrations in the airwaves reach your eardrum, it converts vibration into sound. Sound is created here. So no, it makes vibrations. Sound, if there's a human, it'll make sound. If there's no humans around to listen, it's vibrations. <clears throat> yeah, linguistic contortions lead to mental contortions. Exactly, which is, which is part of the reason why I speak very bluntly on this channel as a choice, right? I used to work, when I was working in security, I worked shall we say, in a diplomatic field. I had to be careful with my words. I had to choose my words wisely. I had to choose my grammar very carefully. When I say grammar, I mean in terms of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. I had to be very careful with the structure of my sentences and my meaning to use my words very precisely. Now, on this channel, I'm not bound by that kind of restriction, right? I'm not working with high-level executives and such and diplomats, so now I can speak freely. But I'm, I speak bluntly because I'm, I'm trying to be clear in that sense and not mince words and faff around and use sophistry. Ideas meet consequences, right? And of course we then, so ideas have consequences, and then we have these, the consequences are absurd abuses of language and logic. So one, we have biological men competing in women's sports. If we cannot define a woman, then anyone can claim to be one and dominate women's athletics, right? 
This undermines the entire purpose of having separate women's sports. We have separate, it undermines the whole point of having categories. Men, women, two separate categories. So this whole idea is completely undermined, right? <clears throat> so which means that they can invade those spaces. They can destroy those spaces by entering them, by invading those spaces. Right? Orwellian Newspeak. Exactly, Sandra. Two, predators abusing gender identity laws. And let me be blunt. I, I, there's, a couple of, um, there's a couple of channels that I follow, a couple of people that I follow, and they constantly publish abuses in terms of violence as well as child abuse, right? Sexual abuse by transgenders, by this new LGBT craze, the whole trans craze. There's a lot of it. It doesn't make it into the papers because obviously it would destroy the narrative, but it is, yeah, it's, it's not just casual. It's not like a one-off. So let's give one example. Police called on 50-year-old transgender swimmer sharing locker room with young girls, right? So here we've got a 50-year-old swimmer who is now having naked showers with girls as young as 13, right? Naked showers, walking around naked in the locker room. So this is a guy with dangly bits, right? Getting to see girls from 13 to 16 in the locker room, right? So girls from aged eight, from eight years old, oh my gosh, eight to 16 were terrified they'd be sharing a locker room with a 50-year-old <clears throat> transgender swimmer at a Canadian swim meet. This, I, I've been watching, been following this. This is disgusting, okay? Let's have a look at another example. Now, this person is 50. They claim to be 13, and therefore they are justified to go swimming with a 13-year-old. Now, what happens is in the one, David Menzies follows this uh, <clears throat> human to their car and they get in the car and they drive off. Now, here's the thing. They're trans age. They're 13 years old. They're a 50-year-old, I believe a university professor. They're 13 years old. They go faff around with kiddies naked in the locker room. Here's my question. They're a 13-year-old swimmer and they acknowledge to be 13 and they can go swimming with the kiddies. How do they have a driver's license if they're 13? Aren't they driving illegally? Shouldn't? their driver's license be pulled, they have a job. Aren't they working illegally? Shouldn't someone be, shouldn't there be some kind of employment law that, that is invoked here because someone is abusing a 13-year-old child, making them work? Someone is allowing a 13-year-old child to drive a car unaccompanied, to own a car, pay, pay for a car, drive a car. Do you understand how fucked up this is? They're 13 for the sake of showing off their their dangly bits to eight-year-old girls. That's okay. They're 13 because it's okay because it's a, it's a gold penis. But they can drive. Don't you have to be 18, 16 to 18 to drive? In, you know, this is a 13-year-old driving a car or they're 50 years old for the sake of driving. Do you understand? Do you, this drives me nuts, right? So let's have a look at a second example here. Again, the trans swimmer, okay? Oopsie. So now, I oh, thought it. Trans swimmer competes against and shares locker room with teenage girls. So this is going around quite a bit, okay? However, let me just go to the third one, just for the sake of completeness. But also, there are many, many of these people that are also being caught abusing children, abusing babies, basically raping kids. This is happening a lot. It's a lot more than you realize. And I mean, it's disturbing when you see the number of these reports, right? So now, growing concerns of links between tra transgenderism and violence and increase in mass shooting by gender-confused individuals is sparking worry over the volatile cocktail of mental health issues and body-altering chemicals. Now, we need to understand here that when you are 13 years old, you guys have all been through puberty. It's you, you are you go crazy. I mean, seriously, you're not mentally stable as a teenager. I know, right? I was there too. But understand now that you are giving young children these drugs, which are only amplifying these crazy mood swings that we all went through, right? So since 2018, five people who identified as trans or were gender confused have gone on killing sprees at schools and businesses. Authorities have been increasingly slow to confirm so-called gender identities and motives. Of course, of course, because um, trans do nothing wrong, right? They didn't do nothing, right? 
So, yeah. So this is turning into a serious problem and it's starting to manifest. And yeah, so leave it at that. So understand anyone cannot claim to identify as a woman, as a 13 year old and drive a car and have a job, but they're 13 years old. Right. And of course, yeah, it's too much logic. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just legalized child abuse. That's what it comes down to. Right, so now they're in women's shelters, then women's bathrooms, women's prisons, making women pregnant. Women are going to women's prisons and making other women pregnant. Right, so this threatens girls' privacy and safety. It erodes free speech. If we cannot define basic terms, radical leftists will insist that misgendering someone is a crime, and they do, and you can go to jail for this. They'll use this to chip away at fundamental rights of free expression. You can't say that's a man, we'll arrest you for that. A perfect example is the men's sports issue, right? Under these absurd circumstances, any number of men can declare they identify as women and join women's teams. And now Leah Thomas, the um, male swimmer that was, what, 400th in the rankings, is now like first or second in the women's rankings, is suing to get into the women's Olympic team. So it's an obvious abuse, and it tells us why unambiguous definitions are so important and why they are going to attack definitions that's why they're going to attack definitions and re rephrase everything they're going to redefine everything so the radical left wants to force society to accept that gender is fluid and entirely self-determined of course the gays are going to tell you that gender is not fluid and it's fixed at birth it's in your hormones and you can't help but be gay you can't help but be lesbian you can't help but be what you are except it's completely fluid and you have no control over it. It's in your genes. But you can be any gender you want at any time just by saying so. Yes. So this is detached from biological and legal reality. There are clear differences between men and women. You can't just wish away. But yeah, that makes sense. You see? But, and they don't. So understand, nominalism. It's just by putting a label on it. This is magical thinking. This is doing spell casting. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, how did we get here? The question is, how did we get here? Nominalism. So, this is the philosophical view that words and names have meaning. But, you see, so words and names have meaning. Of course, we'll get to the point where words and names have no meaning. They're just arbitrary, random labels that have no meaning. Except they have meaning, you see. So, words and names have meanings. But, these meanings do not correspond to objective realities. They, they don't correspond to anything that's real. They're just arbitrary labels we assign to a group of things. So we make a random group of things that kind of looks the same and we jam it all into a box and we stick a label on it. So nominalists believe that things in the real world have no inherent names or categories. We just make up words and names to suit our purposes. Jedi mind tricks, exactly, spell casting. So according to nominalists, there are no universal realities only particular objects and instances, right? So for instance, there's no such category as computer mice. There's no such thing as mice. You see, there's just things that randomly somehow got manufactured or born or whatever that just kind of happen to have similar characteristics that kind of look the same. And because they, oh, this, is, this is a mouse too. You see my mouse, see? But, but we just decided that, that this one, everything that kind of vaguely looks like this, we'd, we'd call it a mouse and we put it in a category. It's not like there's a category called mouse. That's, these are mice. This is mouse. This, you get it? You get it? Right. So we call a collection of objects, whatever we like, dogs, animals, beasts, but there's no objective dogness. There's no objective animalism. You see, nothing separates anything else. So nothing that exists independent of our naming. We're not identifying anything. We are just naming it. You see, we're not seeing something that's real and then saying, okay, well, that falls into a logical category. No, we're just, ra we're just randomly naming it. So names are just labels. They're not reflections of truth. You see, names are labels. Names are not reflections of truth. So the word man, it's just a random label. It's not a reflection of an underlying biological reality. Woman is not an underlying biological and scientific reality. It's just a label that we humans arbitrarily imposed to, to, to exclude men, chicks with dicks, basically. Dr. Jonathan Gemmel says nominalism must eventually lead to insanity. Oh, it does. 
It does. We're seeing it in the world right now. So nominalism contrasts with philosophical realism, which is that words and names correspond to objective features and objective categories that exist in the real world, independent of what we call them. These things are real. They exist as a category. They exist as a type, right? So realism reflects the common sense view that the world has inherent order and structure. And therefore, under nominalism, the world becomes disordered, unstructured. There is no logic, no rules. It is chaos, as I mentioned earlier. So there's a real structure to it, not just what we arbitrarily project onto it. We don't all have the right to impose our own arbitrary meanings and values and morals onto things. We recognize that there is an inherent structure to the world. So a key implication of nominalism is that definitions have no grounding in reality. Nothing. We can define words however we like to suit our agenda. And that's exactly what atheists do. Muslims do it. Right? Sadly, the early Protestants did it as well. Martin Luther was a master at this stuff. Calvin. Right? They developed methods for doing this. So this opens the door to incoherence and subjectivity in language, law, ethics, and society, which is why they must control language. Anarchism says, but I have suspended attending mass due to the same-sex blessings. Um... Look, let's let's drop that topic. I do not want to discuss that today. I'm not going to go there, so so please leave that behind today. Okay, that is why commies in the Soviet Union didn't eradicate completely religion. So, Lloyd, I know these are long sessions, but feel free to get up and use the facilities. You don't need to keep your mouse for all these station. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Obvious. Much appreciated. Um, yeah, no, this is a this is a right hand mouse and this is a left hand. <laughs> yeah, just so I was trying to make a point. So I was just trying to make a point. So nominalism has been described as the philosophy of arbitrary naming or random naming. Because according to nominalists, right, the names and the words we use are not constrained by how the world really is. We can't know how the world really is, because all we have is our subjective view of what's happening inside our own skin, which is completely your personal subjective view. There's no objective reality outside, so you've made up these labels, and I can make up my own labels. See? Zee, zer, zee, him, the they, right? F you. I mean, seriously, whatever. So we can call anything whatever we want, even if it defies reason and common sense. And this is the essence of nominalism and why it leads down such a problematic path. So these first seven slides hopefully encapsulate and give you a clear idea of, of the problem of what we're dealing with. And then this, the rest of the slides tackle the whole length of this thing and go into more depth. But hopefully you understand this problem now. All right. Hi, Lloyd. Really appreciate the things you do. Also talked to the dude before and I talked about him with atheism problem. And he pushed the religion as evil and does wars. That's a lie. I mean, yeah, they've been steeped in it. They, they have been indoctrinated into it. They're lying to you and they're lying to themselves. And that's just how that is, right? People hate the truth. They've been raised to hate the truth. Speaking of which, Jedi mind tricks. Okay, so the Marvel's conclusion. Um, okay, yeah, well, anyway, so universals, okay? Let's look at an example of universals, redness and dogness. So in Western philosophy, right, universals are qualities that can be applied to objects or to entities to logically categorize, to make categories, right, and organize them. Hello, Connor. So, for instance, the universal concept of redness can be attributed to red objects. Those could be cars, those could be apples, could be paint, could be roses, could be balloons, right? But they can all be red. There's a common redness, some sort of aspect, an essence of reality that we apply to this. So, despite their differences, these objects share the common quality of redness. This allows them to be grouped together. This concept of universality right, helps us to recognize and understand similarities amongst different instances of a quality or concept. So you can have an instance would be a balloon. You can have a green balloon and you can separate green balloons from yellow balloons, from pink balloons, from red balloons, right? So these are the instances and then you can separate them into categories based on color. Now dogness, you can see I've got different breeds of dog here. Dogness applies to chihuahuas, okay, to dachshunds, right, or duck dogs, St. Bernard's and Great Danes, right? These dogs are particulars. So that's what they mean by particulars, right? So a particular is of a given category. That's a particular, right? 
So this is a particular of dogs, right? And dogness, though, applies to all of these, right? So this is an individual instance or example of a universal, the universal being dogs, right? So the concept of dogness applies to all dog breeds, regardless of their size, regardless of their appearance, regardless of their temperament, right? Chihuahuas and Great Danes, despite physical and other differences, are both considered dogs. They share certain characteristics, right, down to the biological level. So dogness lets us identify these breeds under the broader universal concept of dog, highlighting shared qualities and characteristics that define a dog. <clears throat> right, so let's look at some more universals, right? Roundness can be attributed to round objects, such as a basketball, a planet, or a wheel, right? Because we know those are round. They have a certain character to them. These objects are instances or the particular instances of the universal concept of roundness. The wheel is an instance of roundness. The planet is an instance of roundness. The sun is an instance, right? A particular instance of roundness. So they share the characteristic of being round. Right? That's the characteristic that they share. The universal concept of honesty can be attributed to honest individuals. Like this guy, George Washington. Everyone knows he was the most honest man who ever lived, right? So we apply honesty as a characteristic, as an attribute to people because there's a concept we have called honesty. So a person we know is truthful. They keep their promises and they act with integrity. So they meet a given standard and they meet a given definition. So that person becomes an instance of a particular objective reality. Yeah, look, I will talk about, um, actually, let me, let me, um, 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 uh, while we're on this topic, so I will one day do this talk, One Nation Under God. I've been working on it. I was working on it um, during the week, right? So I will be talking about um, the U.S. as a Christian nation founded as a Christian nation, and most of the founding fathers as Christians, as opposed to the lie that you were told, that the Constitution is a Christian Constitution. So this is something I'll get to, and we'll talk about all of those issues, but let's not get into all of the confusion now. So, for Americans, George Washington, of course, is an example of an honest person, right? For Christians, Jesus Christ, the Logos, right? That's our example of honesty. So these individuals are particular examples of the universal concept of honesty as they possess the quality of being honest. Right. So in both examples, the universal concept, be it roundness or honesty, can be applied to multiple particular objects right, or individuals, right, following for which, which allows for logical categorization right, based on shared qualities or, or characteristics. So hopefully this is clarified and made clear in terms of logic, what exactly all of this stuff means, all right? So we've got all this clear. So, basic revolutionary Marxism, Leninism 101. So relativism is the belief that there are no objective truths and that knowledge and morality are subjective and vary from person to person or culture to culture. In other words, you make it up as you go, right? To suit your whims. This is particularly self-serving. So pluralism suggests that multiple competing contradictory viewpoints, beliefs, and values can coexist in society. And as we're discovering today, no, they can't. No, they cannot. You cannot have groups that think there's no such thing as objective truth and groups that think there is objective truth, that there's one standard of truth and groups that says truth is whatever I feel. I have my truth. You have your truth, right? You think that I stole the cookie? And I don't think I stole the cookie. And I know you've got footage of it, but my truth is that I didn't. I was reappropriating it because you are a racist white person with white privilege and you can afford to lose a cookie and you're a racist and a bigot and I'm going to call the police for you being racist towards me because, because I justifiably took a cookie because of radical racial oppression that stems back from the legacy of radical racial oppression. Do you understand how this works? Cookie reparations, yeah. See you later, Dr. Jonathan Gemmel. Good to have you for a while. Okay, so hopefully you understand how this works, right? That that's when you start, when truth 
becomes subjective. You make it up as you go, and there is no restriction on the nonsense you will make up. So pagan mysticism are spiritual practices and beliefs outside of organized religions, often involving nature worship or the worship of multiple deities. So when combined with postmodern deconstructionism, right, which questions and undermines traditional concepts and structures, these philosophies lead to chaos and disorder. These are all just examples of the same nonsense, just repackaged, right? They just take on the characteristics of the age that they are in. So in the, in the scientific age, they simply just took on scientific language. So relativism leads to a lack of shared values and principles for societal cohesion, right? Pluralism creates conflicting ideologies and values that cannot be resolved. If everyone's idea is valid, if everyone's truth is correct, if everyone's truth is, well, true for them, then what is the objective standard? What is the single standard that we all meet? And this leads to division. It's error. Anytime there's that kind of division, disagreement, contradiction, incompatibility, you are dealing with error. So <clears throat> now intentional chaos and disorder comes when these philosophies are used by followers, as we are seeing today in the woke movement, to disrupt established systems and gain control. They break down traditional frameworks. And of course, you have confusion and uncertainty. And then, of course, in the midst of the chaos, these alternative ideologies and power structures are imposed. You create chaos and then you take advantage of the chaos by imposing your own ideas. So I heard in the UK that they try to forbid people to pray in their mind near an and yeah, anti-baby. Exactly, that she got arrested. Yeah. Nicodemus says one of my students said they will call the police for someone saying a relative non-offensive label and she was serious. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. These things have the force of law. I mean, they, they feel they're doing good. So pagan mysticism, rejecting of Christianity, and so on, all undermine social order and stability. They create divisions. And now we are seeing the reintroduction of primitive tribal ideas. You know for a fact, society is being split on tribal lines. You get those who believe in logic, the logos, and those who believe in this trash. It's, it's that simple. Yeah. So thank you very much, Lola Main. <clears throat> so for those who want to go through this, and want to own a copy and maybe discuss it on your own time, your social media, or with your own private groups. It's available right now, linked um, comment. If you see the pinned comment, it is available for $5 right now in my coffee shop. So, creating divisions and fracturing communities. So it is nominalism in the court system that allows totalism. I would think so, Lee Aaron. Um, nominalism is, is, a, is an idea that underlies a lot of this. It's really just being contrarian. It's just being against rationality. It's, I think, just the denial of the logos. It's just the opposite view. So, and it's irrational. And totalism, yeah, totalism, it's it's just, it, it allows ambiguity. It, it creates confusion. It allows for views that are simply the opposite of reason. So when pagan mysticism rejects Christianity and its established social framework, you get the erosion of common values and this undermines the cohesion of society, right? So this results in the formation of exclusive and fragmented groups, causing tensions between different religious or spiritual beliefs, right? Those of you who support Palestine, raise your hands. Those who don't, raise your hands, right? We're seeing this. We're being fragmented across these political and religious divides. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> Just five years ago or less, right? Those are not real Muslims. ISIS is not real Muslims. The Taliban is not real Muslims. That's not real Islam. Today... Hamas are real Muslims, right? Hamas is not real Muslims. Those are terrorists. They hijacked the religion. Hamas hijacked Islam. They hijacked the religion. They're not real Muslims. That's not real Islam today. They're real Muslims, and the, the real Muslims are all supporting it. They're all cheerleading for it. So we've gone from not real Muslims to, yeah, that's real Islam. The mosque is off. The truth is out. They've been lying all of this time. So... <clears throat> Such divisions, right, these divisions weaken the social order and stability, and people become more focused on individual pursuits. This is simply their own hedonism, right, their own hedonism. So, and rather than thinking about the collective well-being, everyone becomes, let's think, looters, okay? The Black Lives Mafia. If you think of that group, the Black Lives Mafia, and at the moment, what are you seeing happening in stores all across California? You see looting, because they're interested in their personal pursuits, personal well-being, rather than collective well-being. 
So what's happening is these stores are shutting down. These jobs are closing. This is causing more poverty. Crime causes poverty. Poverty doesn't cause crime. Crime causes poverty. We are getting highly politically polarized. Yeah. So Christianity has a significant role and it's always had a significant role in shaping Western values. Paganism, as it's now being filtered in and introduced, leads to a loss of shared moral principles. Christianity provided a very powerful foundation for our society to build upon, right? For ethical behavior and social norms, like, like men are men, women are women, and guys go to work and the women look after the kids. That wasn't a bad thing. It worked for thousands of years, actually. And now, not so well, right? Because now men are women, women are men, and they can't tell which is which. And yeah, who knows? And so now they want to promote concepts such as compassion, kindness, and forgiveness without the consequent balance of justice, discernment, discrimination. Because discrimination is now bad, which is discernment. So pagan mysticism reflects these principles, right? Now you get moral relativism that undermines moral consensus, no social cohesion, and you cannot generate collective action. You simply cannot have a cohesive society that all rallies around the flag, around a common goal. We are all part of the same identity. Because think, you're not all now part of the same. I'm not British, right? Think about it. Now the Brits want everyone to become, well, to sign up for the army. And everyone's like, but I'm, I'm a Pakistani. I don't have to sign up for the British army. Suddenly they're part of a different group. You don't have a single group identity. So group identities are fractured. Hopefully you're seeing that these philosophies have led to these outcomes in the real world today. Right? So now these institutions, family structures, right, traditional gender roles, marriage, and so on, these were pillars of stability in society. right? This was the framework for social relationships and social responsibilities with clarity. Now it's confusion. right? So undermining these institutions brings back the confusions and the problems that they solved. These traditions solved old problems. Now that you take these traditions away, the problems come back. These are not social norms. These are the problems that were solved. These are the problems that plagued Sodom and Gomorrah, right? <clears throat> yeah, have you seen the rise, for instance, in satanic music videos? That's There's a lot of that going around, right? So, yeah. Now, can a pear be a pineapple? Right? Let's ask Aristotle. So, no. One says no. So according to Western philosophy and logic, a pear cannot be a pineapple, no matter what particular attributes it may have. A particular attribute is like, like the, the color of my skin, right? Whether I've got hair on my face, right? And so on. Those are particular attributes, right? Do I have, do I need to wear a bra because I've got things that require a bra? Those are particular attributes. Of course I do have things. I just jam one of these into each cup of the bra and I see there I got I got I got him I got him so <clears throat> but a pear look if you take pineapple leaves and stick it on a pear it doesn't become a pineapple it's still a pear you just glued some pineapple leaves onto it so Aristotle has a thing called the law of identity and this states that a is a the thing is itself it is not something else a man is a man a man is not a woman A pair has essential qualities or particulars or attributes. These words are common. So you can call it a quality, you can call it an attribute or a particular that makes it a pair, like its shape, its taste, its seeds. With people, you've got your, you've got certain where you have your, your gametes, right? If I have the term correct, um, <clears throat> right? Whether it's you produce sperm or whether you produce eggs, right? So then, of course, you've got your XY and um, XX chromosomes, right? So... Those are the things that, that determine what you are. So these features differentiate from other fruits like pineapples, which have their own distinct qualities. A pineapple has a distinct set of qualities that defines what it is. So no matter how you subjectively feel about, describe, or what you call a pear, it never becomes a pineapple. You can make it look like one. You can paint it. You can take some CGI or whatever, snap it on there. You can make some fake stuff like movie special effects, jam it on there. It'll look like one. It won't taste like one. Because it's not one. Woke conversion therapy camp with loads presentations. Thank you very much, Dr. Obvious. I appreciate that. Yeah. <clears throat> so the two fruits are different in what's called their essences. So what I'm trying to do is just to introduce you to this philosophy utilizing these simple examples, right? 
So you have a thing called essences, like there's the essence of a dog. A dog's not a cat. There's a, there's a cat essence. There's something about a cat. There's something about a man or a woman. There's a certain essence to it. This is the metaphysical aspect of it that makes it a woman. There's, there's something about it. And what makes you, you? There's an essence, you, and that's your soul, right? Now, logic and reason dictate that we must respect these distinctions between things. Edmund Burke, very, very famous conservative from, the, I think, the 19th century, said, society is a contract between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. Now, if you are constantly destroying, redefining, undermining, reinterpreting, and creating at whim new definitions, new rules, new laws, new morals, new social norms, you are not passing on any kind of tradition to the next generation. You are simply destroying you are creating confusion. So there are timeless truths and values that will transcend history and culture. Everything you see now is not a good faith discussion in trying to be inclusive. These are attacks on you. These are attacks on your values. They are designed to destroy. So essences, Aristotle and Aquinas. So Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas had a concept of essence as the defining nature of a thing, but they approached them from slightly different perspectives. Are, apple, are pineapples a part of the patriarchy? Probably, par, probably horse. Yeah, yeah. So, right. Aristotle considered essence as the fundamental nature or defining characteristics of a thing that makes it what it is. So, I hope I'm not being pedantic. Hopefully, I'm not being overwhelming. But we need to understand these philosophical concepts. These things seem very pie in the sky, very far away. When we talk about them, you think, ah, oh, it's just boring old philosophy stuff. We have to understand that these things are the we have to understand how this works so that we can understand, critique, take apart the lie that we're being fed so you can have intelligent conversations. You need to know what these terms are, right? So the essence is the nature or defining characteristics of a thing that makes it what it is. So for Aristotle, essence answers the question, what is it? It's an apple. What is it? It's a mouse. This is a toilet roll, okay? They're not the same thing. These are completely different things. Right? different purposes. The form, right? The form clearly indicates it has a different purpose. The form indicates a different purpose. These are different essences. They clearly have different purposes. Right? So for Aristotle, essence answers the questions, what is it? And this is the underlying reality that gives an object its identity, what it is, right? It creates identity. So he believed that everything in the physical world has an essence and that studying and understanding those essences is crucial for gaining knowledge of something. Aquinas, influenced by Aristotle, built upon these ideas, but he incorporated these ideas into his theological framework. He basically baptized them as, as the term goes, right? Removed the pagan elements and took what he thought was true, but he rigorously tested and applied them. So Aquinas defined essence in relation to the essence of God. Right? So God is the nature or quiddity, the term here, quiddity of a being that is distinct from its essence. So Aquinas argues that everything in the world has both essence and existence. And it is through the existence received from God. So God is not a being. God is being and God gives life to things. It creates them. So everything exists within the substrate that is God. Right. So existence is granted through God, and that essence then manifests in the physical world. So you are created and you exist within the essence that is God. You're brought into existence, you're brought into being, you thus have existence, and your essence then manifests. Hopefully I'm making this clear because I, I was going through lots of very complex stuff and trying to simplify the, the understandings, right? So according to Aquinas, essence represents the objective reality of a thing. Well, existence refers to its act of being in the world. So he believed that the essence of a thing, a thing's nature and a thing's existence, are connected to its intended function or goal. We created this stuff, right? So the things, it exists, right? We brought it into being. It exists. We created it, right? What is its nature? What's its essence? Well, yeah, it's nice and soft and and so on and so on. And But we can also tell by its form what its function is, by its essence, its function, right? Because, as you know, I should have had a couple of stones. A couple of stones don't work as well as this thing, all right? Understand. So, for instance, 
you wouldn't use this for the same purpose as you would this because form clearly defines function, right? Function comes from form. You're not going to use this thing for the same purpose as this. Form and function differ. All right, so hopefully that makes clear the, the sort of philosophical distinctions here. <laughs> okay, so it's just... It's just your boy Jay says, don't buy toilet paper from Lidl. Um, this is a mouse. I think we, this this is a mouse. Okay, for the purposes of this talk, this is a mouse. Not We don't talk about toilet paper on this channel. We don't do jokes and we don't do sarcasm on this channel. As you guys know, those two things are things we do not ever find on this channel. Okay, <clears throat> so now we need to know about the platonic forms or ideas. So if we add the skin of a pineapple or the pineapple's leaves to a pear, is it a pear? No, the answer is no. Adding external attributes, me putting on a bra, taking two tennis balls, jump, jamming them into the cups of the bra, doesn't make him a woman. Even though I've got the external appearance, right? I've now got external characteristics of being more feminine, let's say. I'm not a woman, right? So you've got the external attributes of a pineapple, right? But you don't turn a pear into, pine into a pineapple by just adding leaves. You can even take the skin of the pineapple the little, and glue it onto the pear, but it doesn't make it a pineapple. It's just a pear with the pineapple skin glued on. <clears throat> I've never watched Pulp Fiction, Dr. Obvious. So, TP, we use a bidet, we evolve beyond... Oh my gosh, that's that's advanced, man. I'm, Dude, I'm, I'm still kind of primitive, um, you know, I... Yeah, so I'm, I'm African. We, we, we still, I'm, I'm so grateful that, that like six, seven months ago, we, we, in, in, they finally imported this, this magical, this is magical, you know, my fingers have never smelt cleaner. I can tell you that. Moving on. That was a bad joke. Okay. So according to Western philosophy, an object's essence is not defined by its accidental three seashells. Exactly. An object's essence is not defined by its accidental properties alone. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. That was a bad joke. <clears throat> so, an object's essence is not defined by its accidental properties alone. Accidental doesn't mean it happened by accident or randomly. What it means, accidents are just like the color of my hair versus the color of your hair, right? The color of my hair is an accident, right? It's just a detail that I had no control over. It's an, that is the accident, right? So, those are, so a pear and a pineapple have distinct substantial forms, right? This thing has a distinct, substantial form. We know what mice look like. We can tell just by looking. They're all fundamentally different kinds of things, right? So forms are abstract representations of the ideal version of a quality or concept, at least according to Plato. The ideal forms exist in heaven somewhere, somewhere in the metaphysical realm, and you've got this perfect representation of the thing, and here on Earth, we've got imperfect representations of that thing. We try to make as perfect a representation of the perfect form here on Earth, right? So Plato says that forms which exist separately from the physical world, right, are the true reality behind the imperfect things we see in the physical world. For instance, you have the perfect tree, the perfect cup, the perfect chair. That exists in the form somewhere in the metaphysical realm. And here in the physical realm, we create these things based on the form. So everything has an existence that's metaphysical which materialism denies, right? So form helps us to understand and gain knowledge about the universal traits that multiple things or concepts share. So Plato introduced the concept of forms in his dialogues in Phaedo, Symposium, and Republic, right? So gluing pineapple skin and leaves onto a pear might make it resemble a pineapple, which is superficial or just on the surface. That's what superficial means, right? but it does not change the underlying nature of the pear. It would still retain the essence of a pear. It's still a pear underneath, right? Including shape, taste, seeds, and its DNA. So changing the outside appearance of something does not change its true essence or nature. Toilet paper rolls write their own jokes. <laughs> You're right. Okay, so now the true substance of a thing depends on its formal, what he called the formal and the final causes, right? not just it's what he called the material and efficient causes. And we'll discuss, we'll get into these terms, right? A pair remains a pair no matter what changes are made to the exterior of it, to its appearance. doesn't matter if you make cosmetic changes, right? So let's look at four causes. I'll go on for another five or so minutes. Um, 
yeah so guys if you obviously let me take a moment and do the whole youtube thing remember to floss after meals remember to brush twice a day once in the morning once in the evening and don't forget to change your oil every 10,000 kilometers because on YouTube, you've got to say things like that. And then also remember to like, share, and subscribe. Make jihad on the like button. All right. I'd appreciate that. Let your friends know. And um, yeah, so. <clears throat> exactly. This should be common sense. Yeah. So look, we didn't get this. I didn't get this at school. I can tell you that. So that's why we need to understand. Right. Okay. So four causes. There's essence, purpose, matter, and creation now formal and final causes refer to the essence and the purpose of something right what is the essence of this well it's kind of like mouseness and what is the purpose to do mousy things right that's the formal and final cause we have material and efficient causes this refers to the something's physical composition and how it came into being made of plastic and metal right mostly plastic and it was manufactured in a factory. That's how it came into being. A formal cause, the essence or essential qualities that define the nature or identity of something. So it pertains to its form, structure, and characteristics that make it what it is. A woman, a man, the formal cause, what is its essence, right? It can produce children. That's a woman. A man contributes to the, to the, to the manufacturing of kids, if you will, but he is not a woman. There's a, something substantially different about maleness and femaleness in that regard. Final cause, the purpose or end goal for which something exists. This represents the intended or ultimate function or objective of a thing. So the formal cause, right? So what defines a woman? Well, she can have children, right? What is the final cause? She can actually give birth, right? So, yeah, you know, the term "my truth" does irritate me as well. Okay, a man. <laughs> okay, just okay. Strike that last comment. That was that was that that that's a brain stabbing image. All right. So, material cause. <clears throat> the material cause is the physical substance or matter that constitutes them something. The material that made it, right? That created it. So, this is the material components or or ingredients that form a thing. So, for a woman, it's her chromosomes, right? Versus a man's chromosomes, your XY and your XX. Efficient cause, the process or agency responsible for bringing something into existence or causing a change. This concerns the action, the force, or mechanism that creates or alters something. So these are different causes, as we defined in Western philosophy. And then matter is physical substance or material that something is made from. The ingredients or components that make an object. So what is the thing that makes the number one? Right? What is the thing that makes truth? Those are not physical. Those are metaphysical. So purpose is something's function or goal, meaning its use or its objective. What is the purpose for this? Right? What is its intention? So purpose, can, you can also define as intention. Right? So to recap on outer appearances, if we add pineapple skin or leaves to a pear, would it still be considered a pear? Right? So the philosophy that rejects universals, nominalism, would argue that it becomes a pineapple because we changed its external appearance. We changed the characteristics. Therefore, it's now a pineapple. The pear has become a pineapple. I put in a bra and a wig and I wore a handbag. I'm now a woman. It's that simple. I've also changed the label. Changing the label has created a new object. Simply by changing the label, I'm now a woman, right? So it never had... Pairness. Now, don't forget, because there is no categories, because there are no universal categories, there are no, there actually are no categories, right? It never had pairness. This pair never, this mouse never had mouseness, right? If I do the following, see, this mouse never had mouseness. There is no, there's no mouseness. There's no objective category. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to lovingly take my TP. I put my TP over my mouse. I've now added external on the externals i've added this characteristic of tpness and what do i have i have a toilet roll and you can now use this to in the smallest room in the house you understand how this works so you can now use this in the smallest room in the house because 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 that's nominalism you see it's now it's ma'am it's ma'am 
You understand how that works? Exactly like that. Just nuts. Okay. So nominalism is the philosophy that changing the outer traits of an object can change its essence. Notice, I didn't change the essence. I just put lipstick on the pig. See, that's all I did. It, that's... That's, it's ma'am! Exactly. Understand, I didn't change its essence. The essence remained the same. I just put... Yeah. Magic. This is magic. These guys are doing magic. Right? So nominalists reject the idea of true essences or forms that define the natural essence of things. Instead, they believe that only specific objects are real. Okay? So there's individual things only. Just single individual objects. But... If you change the label, it becomes something else. If you change the essence, or sorry, if you change the externals, the appearance, then you change the thing. That's, yeah. Nominalism is the root of gender ideology. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get through. I'm trying to define this and make it detailed without being boring. And I'm trying to make it, you know, clear as well to simplify. But this philosophy is the, the root of this whole gender ideology and this gender madness, this whole woke plague that we're living through right now. Yes. So TikTok would probably love wiping themselves with a computer mouse would be the new TikTok trend. Yeah, I mean, but think about how stupid that is. I'm, I'm using these examples, but I want to illustrate how stupid this actually is. Sometimes you've got to utilize the dumbest of examples to show people their ideas are freaking stupid, right? Seriously, you've, you've got to go rock bottom to say, look, I mean, this is dumb, right? So these objects are grouped together based on similarities for convenience with no inherent essence. That's why when you say woman, that's not a real label. It's not a real thing. There's no such thing as a woman. There's there's a, there's a single individual arbitrary item that kind of has characteristics that are kind of something that looks roughly like that one, and they've got these things, and that's we've just arbitrarily labeled them as women. It could be a could be a I don't know. It could be a pitchfork. Could be a banana. Could be a woman. Could be could be a puppy. I don't know. It's hard to tell, but you know. See, that, that's the stupidity that you are dealing with. Yes, it imposes presumptions. Exactly. And there are these philosophies do use presumptions. They do, right? So now, nominalists believe that if we rename a pear as a pineapple, it essentially becomes a pineapple. Philosophers like Aristotle and Aquinas obviously disagree. And these are the philosophers that established our worldview. They established our philosophy. They established our mathematics, our science, our biology. They established our laws, the whole thinking process, the, the whole scientific method. We need to thank Aristotle and Aquinas. Aristotle was probably the finest mind that ever lived, right? Aristotle, without the benefit of revelation, came very close to understanding the nature of reality and the truth. I'm not saying the guy wasn't a pagan and didn't have some nutty ideas. He probably did, as far as I know he did. Just like Plato had some really bad ideas, okay? Plato was, yeah, totalitarian and probably not a good example by any means. Aristotle would have had some of those qualities too, but... Aristotle, without the benefit of revelation, produced incredible truths. Right, so they argue that real objective essences or forms exist in the world and are not simply names that we've randomly assigned, like the term names assigned at birth. Okay, gender assigned at birth, sex assigned at birth. You weren't assigned, we recognize that's a dick. Okay, and that makes him a male. That's of a JJ. That's a female. We didn't just assign because they will later on... No, no, no. These are biological, physical, genetic, scientific realities that, that are being ignored. They're ignoring logical categories, the law of identity. They're ignoring genetics. They're ignoring science, hard biological science, and they're just ignoring... So yeah, we, these are established truths, and the whole point is to destroy. Because ultimately, when this stuff goes into Marx and Marxism... Marx states that everything that exists deserves to perish. Everything that exists must be destroyed. That's their aim. The revolution, nothing else. So they've got this perfect utopia, which is completely irrational, utterly satanic. And this is all that they're interested in. They don't care about the little girls. They don't care about the little boys. They don't care about representation. They don't care about... It's the revolution. That's all. So yeah, guys, if you like this, do like, share, subscribe. And um, if you'd like to support the channel, if you like the work that I do, if it benefits you, I would appreciate that. And um, yeah, let's continue. So nominalism fails to explain the origin. So it fails. Now we need to look at some of the issues, other issues with this. It does not explain, it cannot explain 
the origin of similar characteristics or universals that we use to classify or group things together. That makes order, that allows us to make common groups, right? How do we get these things? How how does how how do women all kind of look like women? How do dogs look like dogs? How do cats look like cats? How does cabbage look like cabbage? How do bananas look like bananas? What what what, what gives them this universal characteristic of banana ness? Understand? Cannot explain that. Does not explain that. So according to nominalism, these similarities are just convenient. You see, we look at this thing and go, it kind of vaguely. I'm going to call that a banana, and that one looks kind of similar. No idea why, I'll just call it banana. Oh yeah, just these random items that are growing on the same freaking tree. They're kind of just randomly, because it could have been a kitten. It could have been a necklace. It could have been a, a piston. It could have been a backhoe. And it could have been a tire. And then a banana. It could have been random items growing on the tree. The tree just happened through sheer accident. No one knows how to grow only bananas on it. That was, gee was how did that happen? No idea. Okay. So and and so because of this, these things just happen to be in close proximity. We we kind of just gave them a random label of banana. Guess we're not. Guess we we can't be right in the head. So these are convenient and superficial labels that we apply, and there's no fundamental essence or universal qualities to these things. This is there's a there's a word for this, and I learned this in college. It's called bullshit. Okay. Okay, I apologize, I dropped out of college, but 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 it's a word I picked up. It's a real scientific term that I learned when I was there. So understand, we need to start calling spades, spades. This stuff is trash. So nominalism offers no explanation why these similarities exist or how they arise, which means it is, it is anti-science, it is anti-logic, it is anti-reason, right? So, yeah. Um, thank you, Lilo Main, for the support. Yeah, guys, if you'd like to support the channel, um, super chats or donations, obviously very much, contributions very much appreciated. And um, thanks to you that I, that I have the equipment that I, that I need to do this. Um, okay, so I will do, let me see. Um, okay, so I think, yeah, okay. Let me see. I will do, I'll do a couple more slides. Um, okay, if I go 10 more minutes, max. Okay, so nominalism cannot explain certain things, right? So nominalism has sev severe limitations, as many, several and severe limitations when it comes to explaining the origin of similar characteristics or universals. It's like trying to understand why all humans have two eyes and two ears and a nose, and they'll go, well, do you know there's some humans with one eye because those are called the, 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 the inter-eye the inter people, like this intersex nonsense. No, we know this is a general standard. Humans have two eyes. Anyone that has one eye is either fictional or that is an accident that they had, which means it's an aberration. Okay, it's an abnormality. It is not part of the statistical norm. It is something outside of the norm. We know that's a problem. That's a medical problem, right? Well, so, some women can't, can't have children. So that proves that you can have intersex women that are just like men. No, they don't have dicks. They don't have dangly bits, right? And um, the fact that they can't have children that is an, that is a biological problem they have it is a medical problem and maybe we can fix it maybe we can't but then that's a tragedy it doesn't define a new gender that's all that's simple right the gametes sperm eggs that's it that's the binary there is no other choice and also archaeologists only find male and female skeletons that's it binary so it's like a new <laughs> Michael, welcome. Yeah, dangly bits. Um, yeah, I'm using dangly bits because I'm trying to not swear. Um, because, man, this stuff makes me angry. You don't understand how many hours I've got to spend reading this trash, reading through newspaper articles, and, and just the nonsense that I've got to see in it. It makes me want to choke people, man. It's, it's upsetting. You know, like, got to take the kids roller skating. So, yeah, guys, I'll finish in the next five minutes. I'll, I'll finish up, but thank you for your time. Okay, so... Okay, so... It's trying to... So... It's like us trying to understand why humans have two eyes, two ears and a nose, without acknowledging the underlying shared features that make us all human, right? They are characteristics that create the category called human, right? So nominalists say that these similarities are just labels that we've invented to make sense of the world, but they don't provide a deeper explanation. So realist philosophies offers coherent, consistent ways to understand the world. We, can, we know what a woman is. I can tell just by looking, right? I can tell a banana just by looking. Pears, no problem. Pineapples, one look and I know what it is. I don't have to 
ask for its pronouns. So Plato believed in universals or forms that represented the true essence of things. We know what those true essences are, right? And they exist separately from the physical world. So he said, look, you've got this physical, this metaphysical form, and then you get the physical form. And the physical form has undeniable characteristics that make it undeniably it that thing. Right? So these similarities we observe, humans sharing common features like two eyes and two ears and a nose, are manifestations of the universal form of humanness. So you've got this distinct category called humanness, right? So Aristotle believed that universals were not separate entities, but these things are intrinsic to each object, right? So these universals don't exist in the, metas in the metasphere. So in essence, there's God, and God creates it within us. We carry our individual unique essence, the form, within us, right? So according to him, the shared characteristic that defined our humanness Okay, stem from the common essence of humanness that is present in each individual. So you don't have this perfect form in space, right? You have this form is inherent in the particular, right? Because God has this idea of men and women, and that essence is part and parcel of the physical particular that you are. So nominalists reject the existence of these universals and forms. They say that the similarities are just convention. They're just linguistic agreement. They just... See, social conventions, they're just social, what's the term that they always use? It's a social construct. It's words. It's just random words. Until you dead name someone, until you call Mickey, right? Until you call Mickey Michaela or you call Michaela Mickey, then they want to sue you because words have power. But but until they get there, man and woman, those are just random arbitrary labels. But um, yeah, okay. And here's a question. If, 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 um, sex organs don't define gender, why does and how does removing them affirm gender? If having dangly bits or of a JJ does not define gender, how does removing it affirm your gender? So, so the fact that all humans have two eyes, two ears and nose is just a label, a random label that we have assigned to a group of indiv individuals with similar characteristics. So I hope I'm not doing too much repetition here, but I'm trying to uh, make these points and clarify because they, these are not necessarily easy. And I think the way that universities teach these are complex to make it like a special language meant only for PhDs. And I don't think it's that complex. These things are quite simple ideas. And the reason they make them sound complex is because they're stupid ideas that they are using these fancy terms to hide these fucking stupid ideas because they are bullshit. Uh, Dr. Obvious says, do you ever lecture at university? Uh, no, I I did lecture at college for a couple of years. I've done adult education for several years, um, of course, but then I've got to, I, I'm not on a YouTube channel. I've got to, you know, be very professional. I, I do adult education. I've done, I do corporate training. Um, as I lectured at college for a few, two or three years. Um, I'd happily do it if someone's interested, I guess, but. So, <clears throat> final slide. I'll finish on slide 18. Okay, so I'll finish here, guys. Stupid ideas lead to stupid conclusions. Nominalism's limitations are obvious when we try to understand the origin of shared features. So question, is this all clear to you? I hope I haven't over-elaborated points. I hope I haven't been redundant and repeated myself too much, but hopefully I've made it clear from different angles what it is we're dealing with. I, I can't say that I understand every single item myself. That's why I write these things down, I, because... It's easier for me to just have it like that than I can, you know, because I'm, I'm not saying it's like I have it all memorized. Great. Thanks, Lilo Main. Yeah. But you understand, this stuff is incoherent trash. It is garbage, right? And the reason that they've got to make it sound like, well, you know, you need four years of study to really understand these fine... No, this is sewage. These ideas are sewage. It's intellectual trash. And it's... They make it complex because if they didn't, you'd see right away... This is intellectual garbage. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so. Yeah, Dan Pena. Uh, that the actor. Love the guy. Yeah. Really love his acting. Uh, loved him in Ant-Man, I think it was. He's just hysterically funny. Amazing comedic timing. Also liked him in The Shooter. So, your acquired public speaking skills are evident. I've taught for years and took several courses, uh, but still suck at it. Actually, I did the um, City and Guilds course. I don't have the cert anymore. I left it in Dubai with my employer. Um, but I did the City and Guilds um, train the trainer course teaching. I mean, I, I do. Look, I've, I've taught around the world. I used to teach um, 
martial arts and that sort of thing. I've done seminars, many, many seminars around the world. So I, I still teach on occasion uh, privately. And uh, so there it's a lot of precision because I'm, I'm, I'm doing certain specific things that require great precision, very good use of vocab and definitions and um, demonstrations. So yeah, I, st I do that for those for that purpose. Uh, there's this YouTube I can speak freely. I think you guys know me by now. Um, Jordan Peterson's online university. Oh man, that would be great. Yeah, he's new. Um, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. I just followed it today on Twitter. In fact, on X. Thank you very much, Nicodemus. So yeah, so I want to finish this slide and then we'll call it a night. Okay, it's been an hour and a half, so we'll call it a night. Amazingly nurtured through this divine food that has been given. Yeah. So the science that provides everything, but one astrologer said I can be 50% of gold. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense. The stuff is nuts. <clears throat> okay. Um, here's a question, guys. Here's a question. I was, okay, so to understand how history is misrepresented, because my view is on hopefully understanding that academia has misrepresented certain things. They've given the truth, but not the whole truth. They've left out details, and they've given it a spin, an interpretation that leaves out certain critical pieces of data that allows you to draw or leads you to draw a false conclusion, doesn't allow you to draw the right conclusion, right? Hopefully I'm trying to balance that out. But if I were to do something on say Abraham Lincoln, if you look at the history of Abraham Lincoln, the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, there's a story there, right? And you look at the standard narrative and then you look at some of the additional facts. And I don't mean like conspiracy theory type facts. You just start filling in additional details. You look at some, you take some of the, secondary right some of the secondary peripheral superficial elements and you zoom in on those and you start taking those superficial elements and you flesh them out and you tie them to the main events that are happening and it paints a very different picture i'm not saying i have a conclusion but what i will say is that it adds additional data that just doesn't match the standard narrative and the conclusion that the standard narrative drives to it just leaves you with many more questions but you realize that this story is not complete. It's incomplete. And that incomplete story drives you to a false conclusion. That's, yeah. So that's something I could do is to take, I was thinking about this, this Abraham Lincoln. Um, really, when, once you look at the fact of that case, you examine it, you, you take, you merge a lot of data, you start to derive different ideas and you start to see this is, the story doesn't make sense. There are issues here. So, Okay, let me finish this slide and we're done for tonight. Stupid ideas, stupid conclusions, right? So nominalism's limitations, hopefully I've made it obvious what its limitations are, right? And the origin of shared features, it's just, I can't tell you why things, are, how do we know what dogs are? How do you know what cats are? We can just tell by looking it's a cat, right? He was a vampire hunter, I loved that movie. I absolutely, I saw that movie two or three times. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln, vampire hunter, I thought it was fantastic. I just dig that, yeah. So by denying the existence of underlying universals or essences, nominalists are unable to provide an explanation for why humans have two eyes, two ears, and a nose. This is consistent and common across all humans. They can't explain it. It's just, I don't know. Who knows why? Maybe it's a banana, right? So instead, they're left with superficial explanations that these similarities are just random labels, just words, just social constructs that we've come up with to make sense of the world. I mean, it, you see, it's denying biological reality. It's denying physical reality. It's denying genetic reality. It's denying logic. So the hot debate between nominalists and realists in medieval philosophy was about the existence of universals. The, the dividing line here was back in the medieval era, right? 11th, 12th century around there. Nominalism and realism, this was the major fault line in the theological, philosophical debates. These ideas have real-world implications in law, in theology. This is why I'm discussing it. I started off with law, but it has deep implications in theology as well. And when I get to Martin Luther, Martin Luther is going to take a beating in this talk because I hate that man. Okay, Martin Luther was a disgusting, vile pig, and that's the nicest thing I can say about him. Beyond that, I don't know, maybe he didn't murder a lot of cats, who knows, maybe didn't rape babies. I'm willing to leave that one up in the air. Who knows? But yeah, we, Martin Luther, yeah, this guy jumped, he dove headfirst into this pool of nominalism, right? This corrupted his theology. And we're going to be talking about that a lot. So <clears throat> nominalists like William of Ockham, they believe that universals are just names, just random names. 
that we used to group things together. See, William of Ockham, we've been taught, this is a great intellectual giant. The man was an intellectual midget. The word stupid isn't a strong enough word to define just how freaking stupid this man was. For all his intelligence, for anything else he might have said, it's like saying, I only shagged one three-year-old baby. That doesn't make me a bad person. I only did it once. Okay? That, that's like, no, no. You, you are then a pedophile. Understand? Whatever else this man might have done, the fact that he was someone who promoted this nominalism, and then he did a whole bunch of other things, right? That once you read his stuff, and the fact that he put his pen to the use of, for political aims, for the destruction of rationality and theology, this, he was not a good man. We, we've been taught falsely that these people are intellectual giants that we should respect. We should laugh at these people. We should laugh at them, take their ideas, and use, seriously, their ideas are as valuable as this stuff after it's been used. That's how good their ideas are. The only value in that is flushing it and never looking at it again. Okay, so he said we group things together with random names, but these things don't have real existence. There's no such thing as women. So this view makes it hard to explain how different objects share characteristics, like, like two apples both being red. So for a moment, let's imagine as a final exercise, let's imagine a nominalist world. You see a large group of people wearing hats, right? You cannot say that they share the characteristic of hat wearing. It's not possible, okay? Because universals don't exist. That's a universal trait amongst this group, right? You have to say those individuals are engaging in the act of hat wearing. These random individuals, these arbitrary people, are randomly, arbitrarily engaging individually in the act of hat wearing, but there's no shared characteristic amongst them of wearing hats. This is not, does that make sense? See, there is no shared attribute. I have no idea what, 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 what common attribute would be amongst these 100 people, each of them wearing the same red hat. Can't tell, I have no idea. <laughs> Impossible. Clueless, utterly clueless. Do you understand? So you have to deny reality. You have to deny the evidence of your eyes, the evidence of your senses. You see, it is denial of the truth. And they're teaching you to deny the truth. And if they can get you to disbelieve your lying eyes, they can get you to lie about anything. So let me do one final thing here. So I'll end here, guys, and thank you very much for your time. But this is a quote. This is something that I've now got. For those of you who want to follow me on Twitter, please, it's Lloyd de Jong. This is something that, that I read many years ago that really appeals to me. When the truth is replaced by silence, the silence is a lie. Do not let the truth be replaced by silence. Don't lie for them. You need to speak up. You need to say the truth. You may not be a tidal wave, maybe you're a grain of sand, but one grain of sand, two grains of sand, that'll grind their gears. A hundred grains of sand, you will grind their gears to a halt. Be that grain of sand. Encourage other grains of sand. You don't have to be Superman, you don't have to be Hercules. Be a grain of sand. Remember, when the truth is replaced by silence, the silence is a lie. Don't lie for them. Don't be silent. Thank you very much. And I hope you guys have a wonderful day further. And um, yeah, God bless. Thank you.